Welcome to BioCentury This Week, the podcast with BioCentury's editorial team. I'm Jeff Cranmer, one of the executive editors here at BioCentury, and joining me today are my colleagues. Simon Fishburne, Editor-in-Chief. Stephen Hansen, Director of Biopharma Intelligence. Karen Tkach tusman Director of Biopharma Intelligence. And Selena Koch, Executive Editor. On today's podcast, a pair of NASDAQ IPOs. Does this signal the opening of a window, the growing IL-18 field, and the schizophrenia pipeline? We'll also take a look at the next challenges for Singapore as it grows its biotech ecosystem. And what would this podcast be without getting Simone's thoughts on the Australian Open? But first, let's, let's talk IPOs. CG Oncology and AeroVent both priced IPOs last week. They were the year's first two biotech IPOs on NASDAQ. Stephen, how did they fare? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, no, it was a good, uh, you know, I think pretty good start to the year. CG Oncology, as you mentioned, had a um, had an upsized IPO where it raised three hundred eighty million, so a pretty pretty good sized deal. And then Aravance also upsized, which is a good sign that there's quite a bit of demand out there. Which you know I think was a little bit surprising. I think to me just because the XBI, you know, through the first month of the year has pretty much flatlined, and so it was a little uncertain as to how many sort of uh, incremental buyers there would be out there, but. No, they both did uh, both did really well. Traded up big in the aftermarket. Uh, well, CG Oncology was up ninety six percent. Aravent was up eleven percent. And so far, you know, I mean, it's only been a couple of days of both of those uh, those trade ups are are holding. So I think that's you know it's early, but it's a it's a good sign. Stephen, actually, I was just about to ask you that when you sort of said both of them are holding, and obviously. Coming out with a successful IPO is a great sign and something we're all looking for and probably more excited than we should be about. <laughs> um, but how long, you know, will you be following the sign of its aftermarket performance? It's an interesting question, Simone, because oftentimes what we see with IPOs is, is because you've got, you know, the lockup period where at least a good portion of investors are unable to trade in the stock, you typically have pretty small volume for these IPOs early on, right? And so they tend to kind of, say, drift down. Um, so that would not be surprising if there was a bit of drift in the share price for these companies, you know, early on. But, you know, I think a great sign would be to see if we didn't see that drift. You know, I think that was something that we saw pretty common over the past couple of years. So that would be interesting to watch for. But in some ways, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been as surprised as maybe I was, just given the fact that both of these are Phase three companies, so very much kind of fits in the you know the mold of what we had seen last year. For instance, like Ray's Bio that did well. Uh, that was a September IPO. You know they did well in the aftermarket, and then a couple months later they ended up getting taken out for four billion dollars. So maybe it shouldn't be that much of a surprise that these phase three companies you know have have done well here. What I think will be interesting to sort of be a bit of a litmus test as to kind of where we stand with this IPO market is one of the upcoming IPOs that uh, I don't think it's been scheduled yet. I would expect them to probably be coming out with their S1A pretty soon is Metagenomi. So they're a preclinical gene editing company. So a very different profile from a lot of these other IPOs that we've seen. They're high profile because they've got several sort of high quality partnerships, but that's a very different type of company that you'd be investing in uh, it, with them versus a, a late stage product focused company. So I think if you see that one do well, then, you know, I think then you could maybe say that there's quite a bit more enthusiasm for these for these types of deals than maybe we we had expected. I think that's right, Stephen. And I agree. I think it would be, you know, on the first part of it, you talked about the ones that did do well. It would really be nice to see some logic play out, right? <laughs> to see mm -hmm. companies with the phase three That's right. readouts and so on. For you know, I think what everybody wants is some level of predictability, some level of uh, you know, you're not going to get certainty, of course, but something closer to a situation where they can assess their risk without it yeah. being sort of all over the place. And so when you're talking about the second tranche is sort of how much room is there for something that 
doesn't have immediate data or right. all of the you know all of the boxes checked how many yep. of the boxes can you get and, away with? and and there are and you know there are you know we i mean we even saw sort of exceptions to that even during the really dark days you know of the bear market if you recall prime medicine was able to get out and do a very large ipo as a preclinical gene editing company so you know maybe metagenomia is sort of follows a similar path to them but um sort of more near term you know there were two companies that set their ipo terms that are probably going to be going out very soon so one of those was alto neuroscience that's looking to raise about 100 million at the midpoint for about a 360 million dollar valuation and then um the other one was fractal health which uh, is looking to raise about 110 million at a 700 million dollar valuation so uh, and fractal health i think is is an interesting one as well just because they're so they have a, a thermal ablation device that's in registrational testing for diabetes obesity so sort of playing that kind of metabolic obesity theme but then much earlier in testing uh, i think it's still preclinical is an aav based gene therapy to deliver glp1 that they're looking to develop for diabetes and obesity and so be curious to see what the appetite is sort of how much the sort of you know that the obesity theme sort of is willing to go after something like a gene therapy in that space. So yeah, no, I think there'll be, I think both those will be sort of interesting just to, again, sort of keep temperature where the market's at. Sounds good. Thanks for that, Stephen. Let's turn to drug development. Karen, you took a look at what's happening with IL-18. What did you learn? Well, this is an interesting space that I've been following for quite a while now. A couple of years ago, I did a dive on TH1 cytokines, so cytokines of a certain type of immune profile for cancer, and a lot of activity in IL-2, IL-12, and then there was a little smattering of activity in IL-18. And since then, we've seen that space grow in terms of the number of companies with disclosed products. And um, that's been catalyzed by sort of two separate paths, if you will. One is around the discovery of the IL-18 decoy, an endogenous protein that gets in the way of IL-18 signaling, um, which has opened up this race to identify what are the best ways to avoid that decoy to potentiate IL-18 signaling and drive T-cell responses against cancer. And then the other has been uh, some promising early data on IL-18's ability to supercharge CAR T-cells to help them avoid exhaustion. And some interesting Results have come out of Carl June's group around that. Um, in 2022, ASH, it made a, a splash with some interesting data. And then the follow up so last year looked good as well. Karen, so a couple of things. First of all, it is always really exciting when you see something that is a basic biology understanding, like you're talking about with the decoy receptor translate as and i know that's a thing that you look at all the time what's going from the academic literature directly into drug development programs and so understanding how that unfolds and directly impacts the field is really interesting and of course at the core of what you particularly focus on but tell us about some of the companies that are now in this space and able to move forward on the back of this discovery or this new uh, decoy protein sure so one of them is simca therapeutics founded by Aaron Ring, uh, used to be at Yale, now he's at Fred Hutch, and his lab made the discovery around the decoy receptor. And Simca recently had a deal with Janssen to apply their decoy-resistant IL-18 to CAR T-cells. And this is something where we're kind of seeing a meeting of these two parallel tracks, the uh, discoveries of the IL-18 decoy and how to get around it, and the excitement around what IL-18 can do for CAR T-cells. And interestingly, um, Simka noted that this is a non-exclusive deal, meaning that they anticipate making more partnerships with more CAR-T developers across the ecosystem. So tell us at a high level, you know, CAR-T has come a long way, certainly for blood cancers, and it still faces a lot of challenges. And we've been writing about that recently. I don't know that we're going to see big breakthroughs, for example, but in what way will this new IL-18 approach at a high level, change CAR-T drug development? The idea is that it's something that can help the T cells overcome exhaustion, uh, which has been a really big limit for CAR T cells' ability to perform, and particularly in solid tumors. 
And the ex- oh, so it's solid tumors, but also durability. Uh, yes. So you know this idea of can it reinvigorate exhausted T cells? And there's also this idea that it has effects on other surrounding cells, like NK cells, maybe dendritic cells. The idea is that can it overcome some of the exhaustion that limits immune responses in tumor microenvironments? And so there's a number of companies that have cropped up in this space going after this biology in different ways. We also had Compugen, who recently had their deal with Gilead, and they're getting at the decoy uh, resistance in a different way. They're using an antibody to block the decoy um, receptor itself. And uh, in the case of the Gilead deal, it's not explicitly um, to use for CAR T cells, but it's something where the company said, you know, Gilead said, of course, you know, we would consider the learnings of this um, in terms of our CAR T programs. And interestingly, Gilead, as part of its team unity acquisition, part of the IP there was some CAR T cells expressing IL-18 uh, because team unity, of course, came out of uh, UPenn and the June lab and uh, that ecosystem there. So we're seeing that kind of convergence of this cytokine, what it can do as a monotherapy in combination with checkpoints and uh, what it can do for T cell therapies. It was interesting to see, and if you look in the story, the pipeline of who's going after the cytokine with what modality, and also uh, a dive on how, you know, it's still emerging the understanding of how much the IL-18 receptor is expressed and by what cells. And companies' different hypotheses on that shapes their choice of modality. So you could read about that in the story. Sounds good. Well, one of these days I'll get everyone here at BioCentury to call the University of Pennsylvania Penn rather than UPenn. But uh, it seems to be a losing, losing battle for me. Okay, let's take a short break and then we'll be back to talk schizophrenia. This March, BioCentury Bay Helix and Insights partner McKinsey & Company bring the third East-West Biopharma Summit to Singapore, the gateway to Asia. At the summit, you will get a first-hand look at how the smart money pouring into Singapore plans to scale up the emerging life sciences ecosystem. You will also meet the key players from Asia's innovation arc, from India through Southeast Asia to China, Korea, and Japan. If you are a biopharma executive looking for partners or investors, or a life sciences investor looking for portfolio companies or limited partners, now's the time to meet Asia leaders face-to-face in Singapore. Register today at biocentryeastwest.com. Okay, we're back and we'll be talking about Singapore in just a little bit, but let's turn to the schizophrenia pipeline. Selena, you did a really nice piece last week uh, delving into what is happening in the pipeline for schizophrenia. Uh, What did you find out? Right. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. So the impetus for this particular analysis was, of course, these splashy, large price tag acquisitions at the end of last year of Karuna and Cerebell. You know, no doubt all eyes are going to be on the milestones coming up this year from those two companies as kind of you know, we all want to see how this muscarinic receptor story progresses in the disease, how these things ultimately do on the market and differentiate and things like that. But um, those kind of surprising <laughs> acquisitions in some way um, have brought a lot of attention just to schizophrenia broadly and, and some much needed optimism, I think. So I wanted to look beyond the headliners and see, well, what else is coming? And, you know, it turns out there's a lot, actually. Karuna has a pedufidate this year, but it's not the only company. There is one other pedufidate coming actually next month. There's about, I think, five programs in phase three testing and a bunch more in phase two and phase one. Who has that pedufidate that's coming up? So this is a compound that's been around for a little while. It's from a company called Minerva Neurosciences. It's one whose fate is a little bit more unsure, I think, than the Karuna compound. It actually failed its phase three trials, but it's in the, uh, I would say, the broad bucket of therapies that modulate serotonin and or dopamine, which is kind of one way that I broke up the pipeline. And it was developed with the hopes that it was going to be the first drug specifically designed to treat the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, which just... There haven't been any therapies specifically for that. And it's 
there's been a lot of attention on the positive symptoms, but the negative symptoms are quite chronic and debilitating. So they're, they're very important. So the positive symptoms, these are the more active, um, obvious type symptoms because they involve psychosis, you know, psychotic breaks, all the things that we see in mainstream media, paranoia, delusions, things like that. Um, the negative symptoms are kind of a shutting down of activity, withdrawal from the world, the detachments that prevent people from connecting with people and from working, you know, having jobs. Um, so they're a big source of disability. Selena, you know, um, we just heard from Karen about a very sort of tangible single breakthrough on the IL-18 front. You know, as you say, there's more sort of positive news about schizophrenia than we've had for a little while. And do you feel that there's sort of been something seminal that happened in the field? Or is this just a series of companies continuing to toil away? Yeah. How are you looking at it? So when I look, when I actually, after gathering the list, right, it was more the latter. You know, this is a bunch of companies toiling away. I mean, the big breakthrough, of course, that runs through the Corona and Cerebell deals is the ability to target these muscarinic receptors. So antipsychotics, they generally target dopamine and sometimes also different serotonin receptors. Muscarinic receptors are a longstanding hypothesis in the disease, but it, companies haven't been able to drug them without side effects. And so there's different ways to do that now. And Corona and Cerebell aren't the only companies in town. Um, Nurkin remains an interesting company with several different things in the pipeline and multiple schizophrenia programs this year. But one of those is also an M4 agonist. So similar to Cerebell, so they're a little different. And then there is, there's actually a fourth company called Maplite, which has run a phase one trial of an M1 M4 agonist. So you see a little group of those sorts of companies now. But by and large, there's different ways to get at serotonin and dopamine that companies still think are worth trying. And maybe one company to note in that category is this company called Reviva. They went really under the radar for a long time, but they now have positive phase three data from one trial and have a second trial that's going to read out next year. They'll also have some open label data from that first trial this year. But this is a compound that has kind of a complex uh, receptor binding profile across a wide range of the different variants of serotonin and dopamine receptors. And yeah, it's not a new mechanism. It didn't get a lot of attention, but it has data that kind of speak for themselves. You know, on the major scale that are used in these kinds of trials for schizophrenia, it, it had a pretty robust effect. But I think the most interesting part is that its side effect profile was very similar to placebo, and it actually had fewer discontinuations in the treatment group. So I think anybody who follows schizophrenia knows that these patients are very dissatisfied with the medications that are available to them now. They might be generic, but they have a lot of side effects. And as soon as somebody feels better, often they immediately go off them or they try to go off them, right? Um, so it's a market that's motivated to find alternatives. So that one has, you know, has some promise. But beyond those categories, there's a couple more. There's a few companies who are looking to treat kind of the excitatory inhibitory balance in the brain, not necessarily through, well, not through dopamine or serotonin, at least not directly. Boehringer is one of these companies. It has a couple of different milestones in the pipeline chart, which I encourage you all to look at as a reference. And companies are coming at this for a few different ways, either through NMDA receptor modulation or GABA or a couple of other ways. Boehringer's other program is a actually a digital therapeutic <laughs> that it uh, has a deal with Click Therapeutics 4, and that's also in phase three testing. And then there is also one company trying to get at this disease through epigenetic modulation. So Selena, I think there's a lot of attention, certainly at the early end, maybe not in later drug development, on the potential for something like digital technologies or digital therapeutics to, to help in schizophrenia. So how is how does that work? What are the opportunities and what, for example, is the value proposition and, and technology here? So this particular kind of digital therapeutic is delivered by smartphone. It's a smartphone app. And the idea is to help patients manage particularly the negative symptoms of their disease, but not exclusively. So what I refer to as psychosocial kind of intervention to help draw people out. That's interesting. Uh, I mean, the the use of how, how people are going to end up using smartphones and apps based on them. 
I think it's something we're going to have to continue to follow. Of course, we wrote about that a couple of years back in our Back to School, where we looked at digital therapies and the future of those. And is this one that's going to get reimbursed, Selena? Is it a prescription? It's meant to be a prescription. Yeah, I, you know, reimbursement of digital therapeutics is still something that's evolving. Okay, well, Selena's uh, pipeline is up on biocentury.com. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, worth checking out. Also worth checking out, uh, Simone, who is this sinner fellow? Jeff, when you're asking me who this sinner fellow is, as you put it, that indicates to me that you were not up in the wee hours watching the final of the Australian Open or even the semi-final of the Australian Open. Is that what you're indicating to me, Steph? It, uh, it, 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 it is true, though uh, I, I did like seeing the, uh, the upset of uh, Djokovic. Well, yeah, that, of course, you know, the, the year is already good for me with that. So the year is delivered there. But, of course, you know, and I welcome everybody's uh, emails where we can take this all offline. But um, as I have done with several of my current and former colleagues texting away over, yes, this new phenom in tennis called Yannick Sinner from Italy. Now the question is, who's going to get more, him or Carlos Alcaraz? But uh, yes, it is as it is, as Karen looks at the forefront of innovation and gets excited about that. So in sports, is it also interesting for us always to watch new talent rising and uh, dawning of a new era, which is certainly what we're looking at here. So this guy's the real deal. It was a really good match and worth getting up ridiculously early to watch. <laughs> I was wondering how you were going to bring it back to biotech. Uh, oh, well, yeah. well played. Okay, well, we've written a fair amount of late about the increased interest in Singapore. Simone and Selena, you've uh, written a piece that we'll, we'll get out today. I'm curious, what's behind this momentum? Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I think we have written a lot about Singapore, but people still don't quite, I think, understand what's going on over there. Like various conversations I've had with you know, folks in out there in the drug development realm span from, wow, haven't they been trying to be a hub for a long time and they haven't had any big winner yet to, gosh, look at how far they've come in only 20 years. <laughs> and um, to, wait, stuff's going on in Singapore? You know. um, but so last fall, it seemed to us over here by a century that all of a sudden the pace of news flow out of Singapore seemed to pick up from, you know, kind of a slow stroll to brisk walk or something. Um, so step one was just rounding up what all those news events were. So some of them are essentially the formation of incubator sort of style initiatives, of which Clavis Bio is a party to two. So Clavis was formed from a Singaporean global investment company called Tomasek, and it formally opened its, what it's calling a life sciences collaboration space. It's called Node One uh, in October, on October 4. Um, and that's for pretty young companies to help them form, to help them raise their global profile and form the right kinds of connections to be uh, kind of globally minded from the beginning. And then like the very next day, Clavis along with other investors, Leaps by Bear, Lightstone Ventures, Polaris, and then the drug development sort of expertise and might of Germany's Evatech, formally launched what's called Lab 65, which is an early, early stage incubator. So before companies would be sort of eligible for Node 1. And together, those two are trying to form sort of a continuum of support. And right after that, you saw Johnson & Johnson Innovation increasing its presence in the region, flagship announcing it was going to open a regional hub there, Seattle-based Accelerator Life Sciences, they build and incubate companies. They now have a person permanently stationed there, and they announced their first investment in the region. Also in the fall, Polaris led a $25 million Series A round for engine biosciences in, in Singapore. Um, so it was just kind of one thing after, after another there. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the other things that's interesting here is that there's been a bunch of farmers who've obviously had a presence in Singapore from manufacturing sites for a long time. And then you have new players, as Selena pointed out, like flagship coming in. So I think we can't divorce this from the geopolitics of the region where 
maybe people are looking for a safe haven and certainly Singapore wants to position itself as this sort of neutral territory in Asia, gateway to big markets, as you know, we pointed out, Selena, you pointed out in the story, it's not really about accessing the Singapore market. You know, on the one hand, we're talking about Singapore companies understanding the need to be global from day one and access other markets. And other people we're speaking to anecdotally are seeing Singapore as a place for finance or even, you know, I've got some people who are telling me we just use it as a, it's a great place for us to have our meetings. Some people are in Australia, some people are in the US and we meet physically in Singapore. So it has sort of this gateway presence. And one of the things that that the story uh, gets into, and we're going to talk about more actually at our upcoming conference, is what does Singapore need to do to make itself a viable ongoing hub to keep this momentum? Because it's a question so many places in the world have, how can I be a biotech hub? And Selena, you looked at a little bit of the data right around new companies, well, seed and series A financings, I think, or venture yeah. financing. I mean, we just kind of wanted to know what is the status, you know, right now. If you look at companies headquarters in Singapore or with a like a major site there, how many venture rounds they've disclosed in recent years? It's just a it's just a steady upward trajectory, and that's even at a time you know in the last couple of years when we've seen venture really slow down in other places. Um, the other thing we I wanted to do was kind of just compare the activity there to some other countries that maybe their biotech ecosystem is a little more established and they've been contributing companies to the field for a bit longer. Um, and so we stacked up the activity there against Switzerland, Denmark, Germany, and the UK and France, Israel. And what you see is it's, you know, there's a lot more activity in the UK than in Singapore, for example, but Singapore is not that far off of the other countries in that particular analysis. Okay. Well, you can read the story on Singapore uh, on biocentury.com. And Simone, of course, mentioned our conference. That, of course, is our third East-West Biopharma Summit, which we put on with Bay Helix and McKinsey. It's coming up in early March in Singapore. And you can go to biocenturyeastwest.com. Be a great meeting for investors and... You'll get to check out some cool panels and presenting companies. And if you're a presenting company and you're interested in attending, feel free to reach out to me directly. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for BioCentury this week. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education.